Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Ide. I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, contributing editor to City Journal, and I'll be moderating today's event, DJ Jaffe's Legacy and the Future of Mental Illness Policy Reform. Thank you all so much for joining us. DJ Jaffe was a colleague of mine at the Manhattan Institute, executive director of mentalillnesspolicy.org, author of the important 2017 book, Insane Consequences, and more generally, one of the most important advocates for the seriously mentally ill in America. We lost him almost exactly a month ago to this day and uh, after a struggle with cancer. When DJ passed away last month, uh, we at the Manhattan Institute knew that we wanted to do something for him. We wanted to honor him with an event, but we had to give some thought as to what form that would take. Um, as any of you all know, if you ever work with DJ, uh, DJ never wanted it, never wanted things to be all about him. Uh, for DJ, it was always about um, advancing the cause of mental illness policy reform, affecting improvements in the lives of mentally ill Americans in very material ways. And so what we thought we would do would be to have a, an event with a dual purpose. Um, the first half of today's event will be about DJ himself and his legacy. And in the second half of the event, we're going to shift gears and talk about the future of mental illness policy reform. Uh, there's so much to talk about in the world of mental illness policy, um, both in terms of what has been happening as a result of reforms enacted a few years ago, such as um, the reforms embedded in the 21st Century Cures Act, on um, developments at the state level, the COVID context, which changes any, everything. There's so much to talk about. So we invited a great panel of three individuals who can wear both hats, uh, three individuals who knew DJ well and knew his work well, um, and also re are real leaders in the field of mental illness policy reform. I'm gonna get to the panelists very soon and into the substance of today's discussion. But before that, I wanna make two final introductory points. The first is that we do invite um, comments from the audience, but if you, uh, uh, comments or questions, but if you want to submit a question, you have to be signed in through the Slido platform. Most of you all are probably on Slido. If for some reason you're on Facebook and Q YouTube, welcome to watch on Facebook and YouTube, but you need to be signed in through Slido in order to submit a question, which you can do through going through the Manhattan Institute's Twitter feed or homepage. Also, uh, the last introductory point I want to make is I want to extend a special warm welcome to DJ's family members. Um, a number of whom I know are in attendance today. So without further, ad further ado, the three panelists today that we have are, first of all, Dominic Sisti. Dom is an assistant professor and director of the Scatter Scattergood Program for Applied Ethics of Behavioral Healthcare at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Pete Early, a well-known advocate and the author of Crazy, a Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness, and John Snook, Executive Director of the Treatment Advocacy Center. Dom, uh, why don't we begin with you? What do you consider DJ Jaffe's, DJ Jaffe's legacy to have been? Thank you so much, Stephen. I, um, I'd just like to thank you and, and the Manhattan Institute for this opportunity to convey my thoughts and feelings about uh, D the loss of DJ Jaffe. I owe DJ a debt of gratitude. He he reached out to me in 2015 to thank me for stating what was obvious, that individuals with serious mental illness deserve access to high quality, ethically administered intensive care, just as anyone with a serious medical condition would receive. Um, his email, his first email came to me during the week after a controversial paper I wrote was published. I was receiving actual hate mail and it was the first time I corresponded with DJ. And at the time, um, it was very encouraging. I thought he was a really eccentric character. I would come to learn that actually his eccentricity was actual, actually electricity in the way he advocated for his cause. So, so you see, I was, I was actually a, a very kind of green and relatively new bioethics professor at Penn. And I was on the scene of what I thought was an obvious and massive medical ethics disaster. The, the way individuals with serious mental illnesses have been treated in this country represents a moral and ethical blight 
money is being spent, research is being conducted, but we're doing only slightly better than in the 1980s when individuals with mental illnesses resided in ramshackle state-run facilities. And in fact, we've regressed back to a period of imprisoning mentally ill people. DJ challenged the status quo and what he aptly labeled the mental health industry. He was unrelenting in his attacks. And I must confess, there were moments I felt a little uncomfortable being on, associated with DJ early on in my career because the academy is often not a fan of outspoken advocates. But he was proven right time and time again, both on matters of policy and matters of ethics. I think DJ will also highlight the fact that I completely disagreed with him on certain things. For example, DJ refused to issue an opinion on mass shootings and gun violence more generally and its connection or not connect, non-connection to mental illness. The evidence was clear that it's the guns. But on this point, he told me he wanted to stay in his lane, to which I replied to an email in all caps. This is your lane. We had a heated email exchange, but as always, we returned to our normal friendship based on our shared commitment to those with serious mental illnesses. Uh, in closing, I want to extend my deep condolences to DJ's family, friends, colleagues, and all of you who, like me, had the good fortune to intersect with DJ on our life's journey. He stands as an exemplar of a good troublemaker whose electricity will always power our fight for justice for people who are gravely ill. Thank you. Um, Pete, yes. you care to weigh in on DJ's legacy? Absolutely. Uh, I think the fact that we're using the term serious mental illness is part of DJ's legacy. I'm not sure when that term got coined, but I can absolutely guarantee you that DJ is the one who made it popular. A short time before DJ passed, uh, he sent me an email and a follow-up telephone call urging me to write something about the American Disabilities Act and how the Justice Department was using it to shut down group homes. And I knew about his cancer and I said to him, well, what's going on with your treatment? How are you doing? What's happening? And he immediately brushed me off. He didn't want to talk about that. That was pretty much DJ. He wanted to keep his eye on the prize and pushing the agenda that he believed would help the serious mentally ill was that prize. You know, from the time I met him in 2006, he was always advocating for those he considered the sickest of the sick. You know, my father was a minister and I grew up listening to missionaries and the Bible. And DJ reminded me when I thought about him with his ponytail and his, as he said, eccentric type personality as kind of being a modern day mental health John the Baptist. He was absolutely certain that his ideas were what were needed to help others save lives. And he talked about them incessantly every opportunity he had. He had no use, as we just heard, for the status quo, and he was very impatient with those who, who kept that status quo. I, he's been described as a, the garden party, and I think DJ would have really enjoyed both of those terms. He was much more comfortable on the outside knocking on the door. Um, he started his ad because he, like most of us did, with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, but he soon grew... Uh, uh, impatient with NAMI uh, because he perceived it as straying away from its cause, uh, its, its roots of parents and serious mental illness. And in fact, it, this is why DJ was such a bomb thrower. In 2017, he launched an effort to actually change the entire board at NAMI by flooding it with serious mentally ill uh, advocates. And the organization was so panicked that it changed its very rules to stop him from winning. And at that point, he pretty much brushed him aside. He always supported the Treatment Advocacy Center, which was founded by his mentor and a person he greatly admired, Dr. E. Fuller Torrey. But I think that DJ was happiest when he started his own group where he could, and, and imagine this, this is a guy who just out of the blue sets up a website and decides uh, mental illness, policy org, he's going to use his policy wonkness to start advocating. And 2015, I think it was, he asked me about writing a book. And I said, well, I tell a personal story, personal stories. And he said, I don't want to tell a personal story. 
I want to do policy. And I rolled my eyes and said, okay, DJ, good luck, because who reads policy books? Well, I was wrong. He got a major publisher to publish his book, and he started being called on more and more because of his research and what he had to say. He was instrumental uh, in helping Representative Tim Murphy pass the Helping Families in Crisis Act. He was instrumental in getting Dr. McCann's cats approved as the first assistant secretary of mental health and substance abuse. He was invited to the White House. He was invited to give a TED talk and much to his shock, he was invited to speak at the National Council on Behavioral Health, which is the largest mental health convention, even though his speech attacked the people who are members of it. And so I think he felt in a way that he was actually being included. Um, you know, DJ saw all those as opportunities to speak for people who are rarely heard and for their family members. And as the parent of an adult son with mental illness, although DJ and I didn't agree on everything, I'm not sure anybody ever agreed on everything with DJ, his is a voice we're, we're going to really miss because he had an enthusiasm and a deep commitment. I've talked to many parents who, who he talked to personally. And, uh, you know, for a guy who just started his own group, he did one heck of a job. And, and I'll miss his voice and advocacy. Uh, John? Uh, DJ, as Pete noted, DJ had a long standing relationship with uh, Dr. Tory, uh, the Treatment Advocacy Center, and you worked with him over the years. Um, what do you consider his legacy to be? Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I tell a uh, anecdote on our website that I included um, when we found out about DJ's passing. So. I interned for the Treatment Advocacy Center a million years ago after law school. And DJ was actually the, attended the first hearing I ever went to. He and I went up to um, New York City for a meeting on mental health. And um, we quickly got into um, a bit of a, a fracas with the city council members. DJ was yelling at somebody. Um, it got pretty exciting. We ended up getting thrown out of the meeting. So the uh, the first city uh, city hall meeting, the first mental health meeting I went to, I with DJ, the very first one I had ever gone to, I got thrown out of, and it, it remains the only meeting I've ever been thrown out of. It's it goes back to that same issue that I've always um, experienced with DJ. The conversation that day was the same as the conversation we've had. Now, for nearly the 20 years that I've known DJ, is that if you prioritize everyone, then no one gets prioritized. And his focus, and it's a focus that I think has really benefited the nation, is on those with se severe mental illness. And I think that's the reality of the conversation when it comes to DJ, is that his legacy is a real previously unconsidered focus on the prioritization and the needs of those with the most severe mental illnesses. We're going to talk a little later in this discussion about, about what that meant on the ground, but I think when it comes to family members, that's really the legacy that I think is so important. It's that idea that those with the most serious mental illnesses may need more than other populations we're talking about, and there's nothing wrong with that. And the reality is if we don't prioritize that population and don't ensure that they get what they need, things can really go wrong for not just those folks, not just their families, but for society at large. And I think that's really the fly in the ointment that DJ was, was to say to SAMHSA, to say to the broader mental health community, this population can't be ignored. And when you say, that everyone has a mental illness, that, that one fifth of people have a mental illness, what you're doing is reducing the ability of those with the most serious mental illnesses to get the care they need. And I think that's a legacy that is important to the conversation. And I, I wanna make sure we don't lose because I think that without having that strong voice of bringing us back to that population, I think we lose something. 
And I think one of the really interesting things we'll talk about is just how people from all walks of life and all spectrums of the political community have really embraced that issue, whether it's through addressing data-driven justice or high utilizers. DJ has really proven right in a lot of that work. Yes, and um, uh, I'd like to chime in too <laughs> uh, on DJ's legacy and talk a little bit about uh, his work in the New York City context and also his relationship with uh, conservative institutions. I think in the New York context, DJ will always be very closely associated with Kendra's Law, New York's uh, assisted outpatient treatment program, the best out assisted outpatient treatment program in the nation, which allows uh, mentally ill individuals who've had a kind of rocky history with uh, incarceration, homelessness, to be cared for and stabilized, um, kept safe in the community, uh, provided appropriate supervision and support are there. Uh, DJ was, of course, instrumental in passing Kendra's Law in the late 90s, but not only that, uh, he was extremely active in explaining it and promoting it uh, over the past 20 years um, of, it, of its existence. Um, working with members of the media, journalists, uh, editorial board members, um, city politicians, politicians at the city level and state level. Uh, getting to know DJ for me was not only a constant um, education in mental illness policy, but an education in advocacy at its best. And one thing that I learned from him is that a lot of times advocacy work is very mundane and, and boring even, but DJ uh, was just indefatigable. And, and taking meeting after meeting, he was always happy to meet with anyone to explain to them the importance of Kendra's Law and other reforms for helping seriously mentally ill individuals. The point about Kendra's Law that he stressed more than, more than any other that I think was especially important and often uh, gets lost a lot in the debate is that Kendra's Law assisted outpatient treatment it's not just about requiring treatment for mentally ill individuals. Um, it does require mentally ill individuals to comply with the treatment program. But more important than that, it requires the mental health services system to provide that treatment. Uh, DJ's central theme in his book, Insane Consequences, is that, as John touched on, uh, far too frequently, the mental health services system does not provide treatment services to the seriously mentally ill individuals. And Kendra's Law is one of our best solutions to that problem in particular. There's no question in my mind that the Kendra's Law would not have the profile it now enjoys, the level of support in New York without DJ's efforts. Also in the New York City context, I can't fail to mention the role that DJ recently played in the debate over Thrive NYC. Thrive NYC was a, a major behavioral health initiative that Major de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio um, launched in um, early in his mayoralty, in which DJ early on saw, again, touching on John's, John's points, um, was really more about general wellness and was not targeted enough to that four or five percent of New Yorkers with serious mental illness. Um, it took a few years for the debate in New York City to catch up with DJ, but when it did, it really caught up in force. And um, everyone realized that despite all of these Thrive NYC related efforts, all of this new funding, um, we still have this crisis in this in the, on the streets and the subways and the jails and the homeless shelters. Um, and as a result of DJ's efforts um, is very specific critique of why Thrive NYC was flawed. Um, many city politicians, um, leading progressive figures in New York City now understand and now speak about the importance of having programs that target the seriously mentally ill and not just try to help everybody with mental health issues, broadly speaking. I don't think that you would have seen that turn in the debate um, without DJ's efforts. And lastly, in terms of uh, right of center institutions, DJ, uh, DJ was a proud liberal Democrat, but he was also proud of the many relationships that he had with right of center organizations, uh, people in the law enforcement community and the criminal justice system. Um, he wrote very frequently for publications such as National Review, um, and he had this relationship with, uh, with the Manhattan Institute. Mental health services 
Uh, you know, it's really staggering sometimes the level of government incompetence that you see in, with mental health services in America. It's just extraordinary how much money we spend, how little we get in, re, in, in exchange for in the way of results. Um, and we just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. But I don't know any serious conservatives who would um, deny that government has a solemn obligation to the seriously mentally ill. Whatever else government may be responsible for, clearly it is responsible. Clearly it has a responsibility right here in addressing serious mental illness. And I think that DJ, what DJ taught, me taught my colleagues and many other um, people sort of in, in this in this world of right of center organizations is how to be much more constructive in our criticisms of, of mental health, what to be for, not just to be um, what to be against, and to be, if I may put it this way, kind of pro-government conservatives. Um, that's what I think DJ's legacy is going to be. Does anyone else um, want to weigh in on any points about DJ's legacies? I think it's, um, I really want to, I wonder if we might be able to say more in terms of his work at building coalitions. Yes, he was this, he had this reputation of as a bomb thrower, but in a way that um, it attracted people. And for a bomb thrower, he was really good at, at convening people and bringing them, to, bringing them together. I, I'd like to just say a word. Uh, I, I too um, would would self describe as a left leaning liberal Democrat, and I um, I always found DJ's uh, rapprochement with the right and, and and right of center organizations and, and publications to be so interesting and so um, uh, uh, something to something to model actually, and I've I've tried to do that in my work outside of the academy to not become completely partisan on these issues because I do believe, Stephen, what you just said, I believe this is something we can all agree that our um, our government, our federal government and our state and municipal governments have a solemn duty to protect the least, uh, the, the most vulnerable am are among us. And, 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 that in, and that includes, of course, individuals with serious mental illness. DJ's ability to bridge that gap uh, is something we all really, I think, should observe and and uh, uh, try to uh, replicate in our own behavior and in our own work. And I am, so I, I, I appreciate that point. Well, and and Stephen, if I can build on on Dom's comments, I think the reality that we would always come back to in conversations is that mental illness doesn't care who you voted for, and you could build champions on any part of the aisle. And it was really about what worked at the end of the day and what there was science behind. I think um, the conversations that we had um, with every legislator with the last name Murphy up on the Hill were indicative of that. We would have um, Senator Murphy from Connecticut and Tim Murphy from Pennsylvania, you know, a, a Republican and a Democrat, both very focused on the idea of reform, of needing to take on this population that had been ignored by the federal government for too long. And that conversation, you know, it did not matter in one instance who they had voted for in the last presidential election. The issue really was um, one of the few bipartisan or nonpartisan issues that are out there. And I think that's one of the really gratifying things about this work is that you can go into almost any community and have a conversation with a policymaker and they will will have been touched by this issue. And I think DJ's focus on getting away from the emotion and focusing on the science really helped push that conversation forward because that's really how we get to solutions. I think when it uh, comes to the politics, I think you're both exactly right. Uh, DJ, DJ didn't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. And we had many conversations where he expressed surprise that he was appearing on Fox News. He was part of the Manhattan Institute and that he was uh, aligning himself on Capitol Hill with uh, more Republicans and Democrats because he strongly felt, as he discussed with me, that Republicans were 
not interested in just throwing money at it, but actually trying to change policy. And, and uh, he felt like they were doing a better job when it came to furthering the goals he saw. But let's not kid ourselves. In, in the mental health community, DJ was, was not seen as uh, someone who waved uh, in his personal beliefs. Uh, he, he was a strong advocate uh, for AOT and the things he believed in. And uh, he made that clear from the start. And I think it was unfortunate because uh, in a sense, because um, once you talk to him, uh, uh, you found out that you actually had more that you agreed with, even if you're on the other side, than you first saw. Uh, and that lack of communication in the mental health community, I think uh, it doesn't ben any, uh, benefit any of us because in the long run, what DJ wanted is the same thing that uh, people who oppose his views want, which is a better life uh, uh, for people with mental illness. And one last point about DJ that's, that recently occurred to me in preparation for this event, I reread his book, um, which I, and I, and it struck me just evidence-based is a, a term that's thrown around a lot, not only in the mental health world, but, um, DJ really cared about evidence, and this is a really serious book. I mean, it's just a terrific resource in terms of wanting to study up and get an introduction to any aspect of the mental illness debate. I, I recall um, one instance when we were having a meeting with a um, high-level figure in the de Blasio administration about Thrive NYC and why talking about DJ's issues with Thrive NYC, and the topic of mental health first aid came up. And she and DJ said, well, I, I don't think mental health first aid is a good idea. And she said, well, why do you say that? And he responded, because I've read literally dozens of academic studies about mental health first aid and found it wanting as a result of that. He really did care a great deal about what the evidence said. And um, I mean, his book really shows that. I think that uh, Dr. Fuller Torrey said it best in a tribute to DJ when he said that most of us get these huge studies, these 150 page reports, 160 page reports with footnotes, et cetera. And we read the executive summary and we use, we have our own views on what we're gonna believe when we're on. DJ actually read the whole darn thing. And then he looked up all the footnotes and he checked that. And I often would put something on my blog that he disagreed with and he'd say, where's your evidence? What are you quoting? Where's that, where's that link? and uh, led to some lively debates, but I never met, I, I've met a lot of policy wonks self-described in Washington, DC, and uh, he was at the top of the list. Uh, you couldn't bring up any subject in mental health without him citing some report or study. Of course, they always agreed with his point of view, but he definitely uh, uh, backed up his, his uh, points with studies that, that he felt proved that he was right, you know? Well, uh, we could go on for a long time about um, DJ and his legacy, but I do wanna leave plenty of time for this discussion about policy, um, policy reform, the future of mental health policy reform. Um, John, I thought I would begin with you to kind of ease our way into this topic um, what we should be thinking about in terms of the near-term prospects of mental illness policy reform. We're talking about the 21st Century Cures Act. The 21st Century Cures Act was federal legislation that President Obama signed into law in December 2016. DJ was very much involved in the mental health um, portions of that law. And I guess the question I have is, uh, how is the implementation of that law, how has the implementation of that law gone? To what extent do we need to be thinking about implementation? Versus to what extent do we, do we need to think, be thinking about future legislation to address sort of the unfinished business of the 21st Century Cures Act? Thanks, Stephen. I think one of the realities when it comes to the 21st Century Cures Act is um, we need to think about just how much of a sea change it represented in federal mental health legislation and focus. Um, it is not... Um, an exaggeration to say it was the most extensive bill passed since the Kennedy administration. We simply hadn't focused on mental illness and especially on serious mental illness 
since the Kennedy administration. That's just a reality. So there are both the macro and the micro with the 21st Century Cures Act, but I don't think you can have any conversation about 21st Century Cures or DJ without talking about the reality of reshaping SAMHSA. Um, one of the biggest drivers of reform, um, Senator Murphy would regularly point out that their um, the strategic plan of SAMHSA prior to the changes, that it was a more than 100 page document that set the strategic plan for the agency for years coming going forward, didn't mention schizophrenia once. And, you know, that that's a that's a Democrat. That's not a you know, a, a bomb throwing Republican saying we need to shut down agencies or we need to, you know, get rid of federal government. That's a that's a strong Democrat focusing on the fact that SAMHSA just wasn't doing the work that they needed to do. And so when you talk about 21st century cures, I think the most important aspect was the establishment of both the chief medical officer in Dr. Everett and an assistant secretary in Dr. McCants Katz. And that position and those positions both really led a sea change in the focus of SAMHSA. Uh, it was the first time we had seen SAMHSA come out in favor of assisted outpatient treatment on sort of a micro level, but it also broadly uh, was the first time we had seen SAMHSA really talk about the fact that the incentive structures that were in our system really allowed the most seriously ill to fall through the cracks and end up in our jails and prisons. I think there is a PowerPoint done by Dr. McCants Katz that talks about the inability of our system to engage that most seriously ill population that I would recommend that everyone take a look at. It is such a sea change from what SAMHSA was prior to her establishment. I think that is really, when we talk about 21st century cures, that's where we need to start. But when you dive into some of the changes that we hoped would happen, I think the reality is um, there is still a significant amount to do. Um, I look at the provisions that Senator Cornyn was integral in getting implemented, the provisions around not only decriminalizing mental illness, but really focusing on the data collection aspects. Um, there are provisions in that bill that would require the federal government to report on the costs of imprisonment of individuals with serious mental illness. The involvement of, of mental illness in um, incidents involving law enforcement, both um, individuals with mental illness being hurt and officers being hurt. Those are provisions that if they had been followed through by SAMHSA and DOJ, I think we would have some really helpful data for the conversations that are taking place all throughout the country. Um, I often say that uh, it's great that my organization is the sort of receptacle of the best data on um, law enforcement involvement with mental illness. That's great for our organization, but it's terrible for our country. A random nonprofit in Virginia should not be the receptacle of this information. That is information the federal government, the attorney general should be collecting and it's just not happening. That's the reality on the ground is that sort of data just isn't happening. And I think that's where the biggest hole is. But when it comes to issues like HIPAA, uh, reforming Medicaid to address the IMD exclusion, that idea that the federal government will discriminate against people who need inpatient care, or just simply focusing on the way that communities provide care to the most seriously ill, I think we really have seen a sea change. Um, when we, as we move forward, I think one of the most exciting things that we've seen is the assisted outpatient treatment grants that were created both um, by 21st Century Cures and then a few bills previous to that, they have really proven out to be some of the most successful federal mental health programs that we've seen in decades. Um, communities like Reno, Nevada and rural Alabama seeing million dollar savings from implementing the program. Those are the sort of things that I don't think we would have seen prior to 21st Century Cures. And it's an opportunity to build on in the next administration and as SAMHSA continues its reforms. 
it's it's less these specifics and at the end of the day it's the idea that we aren't going to ignore serious mental illness simply because because they may not have as big a constituency as some other issues and i think that's the opportunity that 21st century cures presents and it's really the legacy that i think dj would want us to focus on is that idea that we are not going to allow those most in need to be ignored um thank you for that john pete yeah. same question uh yeah. sea change or not yeah definitely uh, but you know Waves also can pull back. <laughs> what I mean by that is um, DJ was instrumental in passing the Helping Families in Crisis Act, which is part of the 21st Century Cures Act that applies to mental health. Now, it's interesting to note what John just said, because when Dr. McCants Katz was the first chief medical officer at SAMHSA, she left and wrote a scathing review saying the agency didn't even believe in mental illness. That's where SAMHSA was. Dr. Tory pointed out that in its long range plan, as John suggested, there wasn't even a mention of schizophrenia. So you, the, 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 the original bill out of the house got watered down when it hit the Senate. But what happened then was once it was implemented, DJ, Dr. Tory, and others were able to get Dr. McCants Katz in. And as the head of SAMHSA, she has implemented the key parts that DJ and others were fighting for. What am I talking about? I'm talking about AOT, assisted outpatient treatment. I'm talking about the IMD exclusion. The um, uh, Democrats and disability group stopped uh, um, it from being repealed. But what Dr. McCants has done uh, in the Trump administration is allowed waivers to be granted if states wanted them so they could get around the 16 bed rule. Uh, what's missing of course is there was a great demand by parents to do something about HIPAA, uh, which is confusing. How many parents have come to me and said, I took my kid to the hospital on a psychotic break and now they won't even tell me if he's a patient. Uh, there were efforts to change that. Uh, and, and what Congress did, it took the middle road and said, no, uh, let's just better educate people. Well, unfortunately that's not been a high priority. But those are the kind of things that DJ was after. AOT, uh, IMD, uh, all of these aimed at people with serious mental illness. And I think John hit it right on the head when he said that Dr. McCann's cat has really been able to do a sea change. The question is after the election, whether uh, a new group will come in and simply revert, or if these policies are in place in such a strong way that they will continue and move forward. And that's really important when you have the Treatment Advocacy Center who has been so proficient. I mean, there's only three states that don't have AOT now. And uh, uh, Treatment Advocacy Center is pushing for a bed instead. But with DJ gone, uh, you know, the Treatment Advocacy Center has lost an important ally in um, in trying to get those reforms through, in my opinion. Um, thank you all from the audience. I see a lot of great questions coming in. I'm gonna to get to them as quickly as I can. But Dom, uh, we really need to say something about COVID, I think. Um, and basically uh, my question is, um, mm, okay. what, has, what has COVID meant for the service systems that serve seriously mentally ill individuals? Not just in the mental health care system, but other service systems such as criminal justice, homeless services, and so on. Yeah, um, it's been a, obviously a significant disruption. Um, so, uh, you know, let's just first say that the pandemic, I think, has cast a very um, bright light on the systemic failures in society, not just in mental health care, health care, um, but in, in across the board. But, you know, in the context of healthcare, I think, you know, we were focused in like January, February, March, April, May on very specific issues related to ventilator and PPE triage in major medical centers and ICUs. Um, meanwhile, thousands of nursing homes and other assisted um, living facilities or congregate living facilities were, were ignored. We know that um, at least 40%, I'd say, of the 20, uh, sorry, 200,000 plus deaths now we're at, I think, 
um, you know, 40% of those happened in congregate settings. And we also know that in those settings, there's a large number of individuals with, with serious chronic mental illness in nursing homes. Um, owing in part, I think, to the fact that there's so few psychiatric hospitals uh, and beds. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback from somewhere. Um, so, so in terms of, of inpatient residential living facilities, uh, these were with regard to, to jails and prisons, you know, we know about 30% of jail and prison inmates have a serious mental illness. The majority of individuals are, are black and many were incarcerated for crimes associated with their mental illness pursuant to, you know, really extreme or, you know, sentencing guidelines. So there, at this point, I have a note here, 225,000 cases of coronavirus um, in jails and prisons. That's an infection rate about five times the community and, 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 and a very high mortality rate compared to the community. Inpatient psychiatric settings pose similar challenges. Um, you know, all these places are designed to provide group and milieu therapies. And so obviously now th those are impossible. So, you know, seclusion and isolation are, are generally harmful for these patients. Um, and so I think it's clear now that we need to learn from this pandemic and develop settings that are designed and intended to prevent, you know, the spread of infection, but also allow for necessary in-person contact. So single rooms, and physical space to allow distancing for group and, and other kinds of therapies. Um, you know, all of this, I guess, yeah, I think the COVID, uh, <laughs> the pandemic uh, has taught us that we need competent leadership that respects and accepts science, much like we have, you know, this is a similar problem that, that DJ uh, often complained about, that evidence wasn't being either understood or accepted about the realities of serious mental illness. We need that same urgency in accepting the science about COVID-19 because, um, you know, at the end of the day, the folks who are shouldering this devastating crush of this pandemic are vulnerable Americans and individuals with serious mental illness are those people. So, I think I think the COVID pandemic is a lesson to all of us that we need to be ready to adapt and create systems that are resilient to this kind of disruption, but that we also don't get lose our focus and focus um, uh, that we don't lose our uh, that we don't forget about individuals in congregate settings, nursing homes, and places that are often forgotten in favor of acute care settings and ICUs. That those would be some of the you know reflections I would I would put out there for mental health. I also think that we need to understand and develop better systems for service delivery um, in person again, because these are individuals who need to be uh, t who, who need their caregivers in uh, in hospital settings and in, in in the community. Individuals who are left alone. Uh, to die oftentimes in nursing homes, this is not something uh, that should happen ever again. Many of the individuals in nursing homes died alone. Many of these individuals were mentally ill. That to me is a moral and ethical embarrassment. It should never happen again. So uh, I'll leave that, I'll, I'll just stop there. There's a lot more to say about the impact of COVID on mental health policy, but, but those are some of the, the key, key things that I've been thinking about. Uh I want to take up a question we had from um, someone attending the event named Andrew Slayton, and he asked about uh, residential communities that can house mentally ill individuals for short and long periods of time. We talked a little bit about um, um, hospitals. Um, as he says in his question, they're out of reach for many without financial resources. These are mm -hmm. places that offer very high levels of care, but they're very, very expensive. Um, is there any way that we could look to expanding that option and just making them available, more available to people with limited financial resources is the question. Well, I'll jump in. You know, because of our dreadful history, 
in our warehousing and the abuses that happen in state hospitals, we pass a number of laws that really, and deinstitutionalization, wanting to empty all these places for financial reasons. Uh, we've uh, done the IMD and others, and there's a tremendous fear of uh, returning any kind of state hospitals. Everything wants to be built in the community. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is even in places where you have 72-hour holds, people are being held and released without treatment. People are ending up in jails and prisons. People, my son's case, he was, uh, uh, after much badgering, was allowed to stay in the hospital for uh, 14 days. Well, what was the treatment? The treatment was just take your pill, take your pill, take your pill. It really wasn't any kind of treatment or humane type thing. The truth is we've always had state, uh, we've always had mental hospitals. We didn't close them all down because we have McLean Hospital. We have uh, facilities like Gould Farm. We have places like Cooper Reese, which their questioner uh, mentions, but you have to be very wealthy. I mean, Jesse Close's son, Kalen, spent two years before in McLean Hospital before uh, he could get the symptoms of a schizophrenia under control, two years at more than 20,000 a month. Who can afford that? The question is, uh, there's a push to return to safe, humane state hospitals, to, to a realization that people need a longer time. But the question is, will our government or states ever fund those at the same level and support them at the same level as a McLean hospital? And so it's a tricky path because it, it, you need a combination of community care, robustly funded, but you also need, we're seeing, and DJ would argue for longer term care for those people who need a longer time to get better. Uh, and unfortunately, we're like dogs fighting and scraps thrown off the table when it comes to, oh, community versus state hospitals rather than being unified in that, I believe. Right. I think Pete is exactly right. I think the issues finally are starting to coalesce. I think for years we saw various aspects of these issues being advocated for. We would have um, conversations about the need for hospital beds while another group was having conversations about insurance parity, while another group was having conversations about the need for peer support. And the reality is if this was any other illness, you would never have those bifurcated conversations. You would have a conversation about a consistent, effective, well-funded treatment system. And I think that's where we're finally getting to. You know, we shouldn't be forced to have Dr. Sharon, the, the head of the Los Angeles Mental Health Department, going into the newspaper and talking about his deep fear of the loss of board and care facilities because they're is gonna be nowhere for the population of seriously mentally ill to go. We shouldn't be at that point. We know what works and we know funding it effectively saves us money. And so that's the, where I think we're going. And I think Pete really flags the, the important aspect here that a full continuum of care where we're all rowing in the same direction gets us where we need to be. And I think the the conversations that DJ points us back to of focusing on the evidence and on addressing those with the most serious mental illness helps us keep that conversation moving in the right direction. So I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. use to that legacy. Uh, one more wow. question from the audience uh, from a woman named Linda Mayo in California. And she asked, we've talked about uh, funding um, places like McLean Hospital. We've talked about the IMD waiver. Her question is about legal changes regarding civil commitment. Mm. She says, quote, I'm a mother of twin daughters with schizophrenia. Um, a primary obstacle to treatment here in California is a legislative attitude regarding violation of civil rights and involuntary treatment. Um, even assuming we get some movement on the fiscal front, is there any um, prospects of changes on the legal front? I think yeah, I'll, I'll jump in just because this is sort of our bailiwick and I'll turn it over to everyone else. Um, I think California is recognizing um, this in two ways. Uh, there was a bill that was passed by the legislature this session that would really modernize and prioritize their assisted outpatient treatment program. And I think that is a really important step to get them in the right direction. But I think the the missing piece, the piece that everyone 
in California is talking about is the lack of any sort of effective oversight of the mental health system there. I think um, what you're seeing in the conversations that are being shorthanded as civil liberties is really a pushback against any sort of actual oversight. Right now, the law that is being discussed is saying once someone is 5150, which is the, the sort of pickup in, in California, once someone is picked up eight or more times, then the system can step in. And you say, if this was any other illness, and we said we're going to let someone fall into crisis, we're going to have eight strokes before treatment can be provided, people would be up in arms. And I think that's where California is still broken, is that inability to really step in and say, we're going to provide oversight and not allow you to let the most seriously ill fall through the cracks. I would second that, John. I mean, I think one of the other um, legacies of DJ and the Cures Act is to advance this idea of conceptual parity where mental illness is seen as illness. It's it's not seen as something any you know different than illness. And um, and the idea that we would not hospitalize or a person wouldn't be hospitalized with, say, an aneurysm in their aorta until it bursts, it makes no sense, right? And that's what that's what it's like in mental health. When you have a psychotic episode, then you get hospitalized. That's too late. Um, and so I think, and I can, you know, anecdotally, just in my my teaching of residents, like psychiatry residents, young psychiatrists see this. They see that the commitment laws are um, are 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 too are too uh, the bar is set way too high, and it's and it's set up to fail essentially. That these folks, by the time they're that sick, they will cycle back through. The CRCs, the emergency departments, the jails, the homelessness, the, the young psychiatrists see this. And I do think that that's promising. I think they will be the leaders in the future that will make this change. Look, um, I, I want my son's civil rights protected, but having a standard that calls for dangerousness is a fool standard. Uh, first of all, you can't predict dangerousness and waiting until it happens delegates people to go in jails and, and, and in prisons. You know, the treatment advocacy Center released a report this week that concluded that it looked at civil commitment laws and it says, we have 50 different states all doing it differently. Everybody has their own. Mm -hmm. And I would argue we even go beyond that. In Virginia, for instance, Fairfax County where I live, because you have three administrative law judges who really take a negative view about commitment, uh, it's much harder to get somebody committed than the adjoining county. So you have this patchwork of, uh, people trying to follow a law that uh, that is a fool standard. Uh, we want to protect rights, but we also want to have a right to treatment. That people who are sick and can't speak for themselves should have not be abandoned on our streets. And we have to put in places that are in England and France and places like that where they recognize someone's illness, they recognize they need to safeguard those people from being abused, but they step in and help them get better. Um, we are running very short on time, and we at the commitment at the Manhattan Institute are committed to keeping ending things on time. I wanted to give our fan panelists a, just an opportunity for very brief, like one minute or so, closing remarks. Anything else you'd like to add before? And I have a message from the family I'd like to read at the very end. Uh, John, you want to begin very briefly? John, I think we're not hearing you. Uh, Dom, you want to leap in? We'll, we'll yeah, start. sure. I'll just jump in and then maybe John will come back. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I just want to, again, express my condolences to DJ's family and friends. It was really a privilege. Honestly, this was a privilege to be able to read his book at, in advance and comment on it. That that was that made me feel um, so good. And it was, you know, DJ was so generous in that way. He he included everyone in all of his work. He gave credit where it was due. And he, he pushed me to grow as a scholar and as an advocate. And I, and I just, I guess I'll leave, um, I'll leave it there because, um, you know, that's how I'll, I'll always remember DJ as a, as a mentor and as a friend. So. Pete. I love DJ's enthusiasm. He had an energy and I think even those who, disagreed with him and, and didn't like him, have to respect the fact that DJ walked the talk. 
I mean, he deeply cared about parents such as me and others who are dealing with our loved ones who have a serious mental illness, and he made them a priority, and for that, I'll be forever grateful. John, you ready to go? Yes, sorry about that. Um, I think I would echo uh, Pete and Dom's comments, and thank you, Stephen, and the Manhattan Institute for taking the time to put together this, this wonderful memorial for DJ in remembrance of him. So I think the um, one thing that I would ask everybody to do, um, seeing as this is a, a DJ da Jaffe memorial, is to get involved, is to, one, buy his book and read it and get yourself educated on these issues. Um, I think a great legacy is to both buy his book and to learn from it and then take those lessons and really use them. I think DJ was all about action, not just talking about things. And I think that's a great legacy that we can all take up. Uh, thank you all for that. As I said, I, we have a message um, from Bob Jaffe, DJ's brother, that I'd like to read. Um, on behalf of DJ's family, we are forever grateful for your kindness at the time of DJ's passing. Meaningful and effective mental health policy was his passion. He was blessed to be on the team with you all. Thanks for your expression of love and caring for our beloved brother, DJ. Um, and th what I, the point I'd like to conclude with is actually about Team DJ uh, as well. And I say this um, speaking to the other panelists and the members of the audience. DJ set a very high bar in terms of the depth of his commitment, his knowledge of the system, his energy. It's hard to think who can actually replicate um, him. He, he, was, he was unique. Um, but he also stood at the center of this coalition that I think all of us are sort of at least loosely affiliated with. And my hope is that this coalition can, um, uh, can stay together, not just because it's what DJ would have wanted, but uh, this is the model for reform. This is the model for reform that was behind the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act and many other reforms uh, was the reform that DJ modeled for us. So any the prospects for future reforms, I think we really need to be thinking about following the path that he, he laid out for all of this. Uh, thank you so much to Dom, John, and Pete for participating. Thank you all audience members for attending today's event. Uh, this concludes today's event on DJ Jaffe's legacy and the future of mental illness policy reform.